It is the most expensive musical in Broadway history, and for its Spider-Man. You know, on Broadway, no show on, in history has had so many accidents, cost so much. It hasn't even opened yet, but there has been another accident for the most expensive Broadway musical ever. A stuntman in Spider-Man turn off. Hello, welcome to Comic Tropes. I'm your host, Chris. Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark was a big budget Broadway musical that ran from the end of 2010 through the beginning of 2014. I was lucky enough to see it, lucky enough, and I will say that it had some catchy songs, some amazing stunt work, and a fun romantic take on the Spider-Man story. But behind the scenes, it was a troubled production. Personality clashes, huge budget expenditures, a lot of injuries. This show was doomed before it began. Today, we're going to talk about its history. Before I go too far, this episode is sponsored by me. Please consider taking a look in the description below. There is a link to my Vampirella cover. That is available for just a few more days. That is a project I'm doing with Dynamite Comics. Hope you'll consider it, and without any further ado, let's talk about Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark. Spider-Man was not the first comic to be turned into a Broadway musical, and not the last. Some of the more impressive examples include Annie and Fun Home. A superhero musical on paper sounds like it could translate pretty well to theater. They both feature larger-than-life characters, and while superheroes tend to resolve conflicts with big fights, in musicals, the characters just get so emotional they can't help but sing. It could translate, but rarely has done so well. In 1966, DC Comics licensed Superman for the musical It's a Bird, It's a Plane, It's Superman, which shut down just three and a half months after opening. But now, let's jump ahead to the early 2000s. Spider-Man and its sequel, both from director Sam Raimi, had proven incredibly successful at the box office. Less than a decade earlier, Marvel Comics had sold off most of its movie rights to save itself from bankruptcy. Following this movie success, Marvel had interest in licensing the character to tell a similar story, but as a live performance to New York's hungry audience for musical theater. In August of 2002, Marvel approached film producer Tony Adams to develop Spider-Man into a Broadway musical. Adams was best known for producing director Blake Edwards' Pink Panther movies and Edwards' movie Victor Victoria. Adams then adapted Victor Victoria into a hit Broadway musical. Adams leapt at the chance and first signed filmmaker Neil Jordan to script the musical. The following month, he flew to Ireland to talk to U2 band members Bono and The Edge. They agreed to write the music and lyrics. That Christmas, Adams bumped into theatrical director Julie Taymor and approached her to direct the musical. Taymor had achieved massive success with the Broadway adaptation of The Lion King, which went on to become the most successful Broadway show of all time, earning over $1.8 billion as of this year. U2 had touring and album obligations that would slow things down, but everyone gathered at The Edge's apartment in October of 2005 to sign contracts. While The Edge went to grab a pen, Tony Adams suffered a massive stroke and passed away. The man who would oversee everything was suddenly gone, and his responsibilities fell to his business partner and protege, a man named David Garfinkel. Garfinkel had little experience producing, and allowed Tamor to run the show the way she saw fit. The Lion King production had Disney telling her no when she went too far from the subject matter, but no one was doing that for Spider-Man. You might be asking, wasn't there anyone from Marvel Comics involved in this production to make sure that it felt authentic to Spider-Man? And the answer is, not really. In 1996, Marvel was bought by Toy Biz. It helped bring it out of its bankruptcy. The CEO of Toy Biz was a man named Avi Arad. He became Marvel's chief creative officer, and he also produced a lot of Marvel's early films. 
By 2006, he was kind of tired of that role and he stepped down, so he was not involved anymore. A lot of the responsibilities just fell to David Garfinkel, who did not have much production experience. And the contract that Marvel had signed with Garfinkel specifically was to adapt the stories from Ultimate Spider-Man issues 1 through 7, as well as Amazing Fantasy number 15. Ultimate Spider-Man was a reboot of Spider-Man that debuted in 2000 from writer Brian Michael Bendis and artist Mark Bagley. And just recently, Bendis revealed that Avi Arad had approached Bendis to work on the musical's book, the script that tells the story between the musical numbers. He's releasing that story on his Substack newsletter, Jinx World, and explaining his brief involvement. While we don't know his full story as of the time of this episode, we do know that Arad suggested Bendis' involvement after Julie Taymor refused to work with writer Neil Jordan, who had won an Oscar for his film The Crying Game. Instead, Taymor brought on writer Glenn Berger to assist her. Before I go too far into discussing the musical itself, I need to credit the YouTube channel Turn Off the Dark Archives. Since there is no official video release of this musical, this channel has worked hard to put together bootleg recordings and promotional material. Fortunately, I saw the musical, so I got to appreciate the songs and stunt work up close. But even with that said, the musical went through some changes, and Turn Off the Dark Archives helped me to see the differences. The production itself ramped up, but slowly, as you 2 were busy touring, and Garfinkel worked to secure the location and crew needed to fulfill the stunt work and its rigging. In June of 2009, the show hired Hollywood actress Evan Rachel Wood to play Spider-Man's love interest, Mary Jane Watson, and actor Alan Cumming to play the Green Goblin. But delays led to both of them exiting their roles before the show began. Ultimately, Turn Off the Dark hired up-and-comer Reeve Carney as Peter Parker's Spider-Man, and Broadway veteran Patrick Page as Norman Osborn Green Goblin. One of the biggest problems with the musical was the script by Julie Taymor. Tamor and Berger put together a treatment by July of 2004 called Spider-Man Caught, which told a story about an ancient goddess named Arachne, not the superhero Arachne, just to be clear, who chooses to turn Peter Parker into Spider-Man and then wants to marry and consume him. Marvel got the final draft by July of 2005 and rejected it completely. They replied in writing, stating that it was, quote, wholly unsatisfactory and, quote, contrary to the spirit and letter of the agreement. The concept is entirely wrong, and the tone of the treatment, which is quite dark, is not what Marvel anticipated receiving at all, end quote. Marvel added detail to their complaints, writing, quote, the Arachne myth has no place in the Spider-Man legend, despite being recounted by Norman Osborn in one of the Ultimate Spider-Man comic books. We feel the inclusion of Arachne as a motivator and companion to Peter Parker, and consequently Spider-Man, is unnecessary. Indeed, it detracts from the ability to tell a story through Peter Parker's eyes." End quote. Marvel objected to the darkness and sexuality of Tamor's story, specifically objecting to scenes where Peter Parker's boss's head is bitten off by a villain, the death of Aunt May on stage, and the implied attempted rape of Spider-Man by Arachne. Tamor insisted Marvel wait until they see the story on stage before they made any changes, and Marvel relented. Marvel should have put their foot down by now because the story is really just weird. The first act alone introduces Spider-Man's origin, Green Goblin's origin, and has Spider-Man defeat Green Goblin before the act ends. And then the second act is all about Arachne going after Spider-Man. Uh, basically, Julie Taymor wanted to do a story where superheroes are the modern versions of ancient Greek myths, and she wasn't subtle about it. Now, that may have worked with some superheroes, maybe some DC characters. It really didn't suit Spider-Man. One aspect of Taymor's story that never went over well with Marvel, and eventually audiences, was the so-called Geek Chorus. It was four nerds talking about Spider-Man and telling his story, removing the characters even further from the audience. 
The geek chorus would interrupt and rewrite scenes, which made it feel like we were watching fan fiction instead of an actual story. And because Arachne was guiding the fate of Peter Parker, it never felt like Spider-Man was proactive enough. He ends Act 1 declaring that he is Spider-Man, but begins Act 2 giving up his responsibilities to pursue a relationship with Mary Jane. Was this cast and crew the best group for adapting Spider-Man? Bono and the Edge had never worked in musicals before, but had a lot of success as musicians. Tamor had directed the most successful Broadway play ever, and some of the crew was amazing. Having seen the musical, I can tell you that the sets by George Sipin were innovative and exciting. They were epic. They would feature everything from a massive set for Oscorp to movable walls for stunts, projected imagery for the city or to represent villains, and movable skyscrapers. The stunt work had problems which we'll address, but when it worked, it was incredible. Spider-Man and Green Goblin would fly over your heads, battling each other and making everything feel close and personal. Sam Raimi's Spider-Man movies worked because he grew up a fan of the material. The technology to pull off the stunts was there. But who on the musical was there to make sure Spider-Man felt authentic? No one, really. Also, it unfortunately cost a literal fortune. Tamor's play called for a lot of wire work to pull off the stunts, and one of the earliest mistakes by producer David Garfinkel was probably to rent out the Foxwoods Theater, one of the biggest and oldest theaters on Broadway. Sure, as the biggest theater, it could sell a lot of seats, just shy of 2,000, but it wasn't built with the rigging needed to pull off wire stunts. Worse, when the production had to remove parts of the theater to build the underlying mechanics, they had to carefully preserve everything because it was designated by the city as historically significant. The production began renting the Foxwoods for two years before they actually started selling tickets due to various delays. That alone cost $4 million. The flying equipment, similar to what professional football games use to move the cameras across the field, cost over $2 million. Sets and costumes ran nearly $10 million. These huge costs also led to some of the delays because the producers had to put things on pause and raise more money from investors several times. By the time the musical launched in 2011, it was reported to cost $75 million. As a point of comparison, most Broadway shows cost between five to $15 million. Tamor originally had Arachne cast a massive web that ran the length of the theater and cost over $1 million alone. But it kept not deploying correctly and worse, snagging onto other wire work, so it did get cut. Turn Off the Dark cost over a million dollars in weekly expenses just for the rigging alone and overall show costs went up when the show was no longer able to get accident insurance because of all the injuries to the cast. Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark became the most expensive Broadway show of all time, by far. The second closest is King Kong at $35 million, and then Shrek, which cost $25 million. Not even close to the $75 million we're talking about. Analysts predicted that the show would need to sell out for five years straight just to break even. That was never going to happen. Behind the scenes, Bono and the Edge, Tamor, and Marvel were pointing fingers. Marvel demanded changes to the script, but Tamor refused to budge. By the time it ended, investors had lost over $60 million. But the show did eventually launch, and to be fair, it did briefly hold the box office record for one week, taking in over $2.9 million in January of 2012. It was beaten by Wicked later that year, but Turn Off the Dark still holds the record for the most preview performances. A preview performance is when the show opens to the general public selling tickets, but with the understanding that the story, some songs, other elements may change. It's still exciting for the average theater goer because they get to see what changes get made and they get bragging rights that they saw it first. Now, the average 
preview performance period is between two to five weeks. Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark holds the record for the most preview showings with over 182 previews and over six months of them. During this period, it's not supposed to be officially reviewed by the press, but because it went so long, of course they did, and it got some pretty terrible reviews, which basically added to its reputation. The preview performances began on November 10th, 2010, and the official opening took place on June 14th of 2011. Beyond the issues between Tamor's story and what Marvel wanted, the stunt work had problems, and that's putting it mildly. The first show had to be stopped five times due to technical issues, including the climax at the end of Act 1 where Spidey was just left dangling overhead and stagehands were trying desperately to grab his foot to pull him down. But that was small potatoes compared to the injuries that occurred. Before the show launched, two stunt performers had been injured. In October of 2010, Kevin Aubin was performing a stunt as Spider-Man where the wires essentially slingshot him across the stage, and he shattered both of his wrists while bracing for the impact. Another actor told the New York Times that he had broken a toe during the same stunt earlier that month. It prompted the New York State Department of Labor to investigate and cite the production. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, later fined Turn Off the Dark over $12,000 in March of 2011 for safety violations. Actress Natalie Mendoza played Arachne and was struck in the head by flying equipment on the evening of November 28th, which gave her a concussion, and she soon took a couple of weeks off to recover. On December 20th of 2010, one of the most serious injuries took place. Stunt performer Christopher Tierney was supposed to leap off a bridge to catch Mary Jane. In footage from a theatergoer shared with the Associated Press, you can see that the harness meant to hold Tierney instantly lets go. He fell over 20 feet into the orchestra pit below, suffering a skull fracture and cracked vertebrae. Fortunately, Tierney went through rehabilitation and even returned to the show on April 25th of 2011. Actress T.V. Carpio replaced Mendoza as Arachne and encountered a neck injury on the March 16th show. She left the show for two weeks to recover. Finally, after a long run of injury-free performances, actor Daniel Curry was injured on August 15th of 2013 when some equipment fell on his leg and foot, which resulted in him having extensive surgery. He filed a lawsuit against the producers and OSHA fined the show. Still, if you were lucky enough to see the show on a night when everything went right, the stunts were pretty incredible. What wasn't incredible was the story. The producers and Marvel knew it, but Tamor refused to make any changes. Eventually, the show brought on a new writer to revise the musical's book, Roberto Aguirre Sacasa. He had experience writing both plays and comic books and came on board on February 11th. Tamor quit in March, and sued the show for conspiring to fire her. So let's talk about the story, because that is the big problem. As bad as budget overruns and injuries are, those are details that could probably be overcome if the story was excellent, which it was not. Now, there are two distinct versions of Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark. There's the original version by Julie Taymor and Glenn Berger, and then there is the revised version by Roberto Aguirre Sacasa. We're going to talk about both. The original play starts with a battle between Spider-Man and the Green Goblin, only to be interrupted by the geek chorus, who are narrating the story and making it up as it goes along. Gigi, the only female member, explains Spider-Man wasn't the first person to have spider powers, and she tells the story of Arachne. Arachne was the best weaver in the world, which made the goddess Athena jealous, and she caused Arachne to hang herself. Arachne is then further punished for trying to be better than the gods, and turned into an immortal spider creature. Dark stuff that's not very Spider-Man related, but I will admit the dancing and weaving in this song is amazing. Then we cut to Peter Parker reporting on Arachne at school and reminding the teacher to assign them homework. The second song is called Bullying by Numbers and has Flash Thompson and his friends beating up Peter. Peter walks home and talks with Mary Jane, his crush. 
It transitions into a song where Peter is told by his Uncle Ben to rise above the bullies, while Mary Jane deals with her abusive father. Next, we go to Oscorp, where Norman Osborn has a wife, Emily. This is a change from the comics, and there is no Harry Osborn in Turn Off the Dark. The Osborns are working to alter DNA so that people can survive climate change. Their work is interrupted by Peter, Mary Jane, Flash, and their fellow students visiting on a field trip. Peter talks about how female spiders put out a sex lure. Then Norman breaks into a song about how changing DNA will save the world. It's weird, but the Osborne set and group of dancing students is exciting. Peter gets bitten by one of the experimental spiders, and then the geek chorus interrupts to talk about how awesome that is for Peter. But GG explains that it wasn't random luck. Peter was a chosen one, and the fates had decided that he would get spider powers. And I gotta interrupt here to say, I think that this fate piece really takes away from an important aspect of Spider-Man. Stan Lee always said that it could be anyone under Spider-Man's mask, and that was part of his appeal. Peter Parker's everyman status really made it more impressive when he overcame the odds to defeat his enemies. Here, it's not possible that it would be you or I that could have the luck of getting bitten by a spider and turning into Spider-Man. No, it's fate. It was always going to be that guy, Peter Parker. Nobody else. Peter wakes up the next day to realize he has powers, and he jumps around his room in the first real bit of stunt work and sings one of the songs I enjoyed a bit more than the others, Bouncing Off the Walls. Peter beats up the bullies at school and decides he needs a car to impress Mary Jane. The Geek Chorus once again grind things to a halt, talking about how excited they are to see Spider-Man in his costume, only for Gigi to say it's unrealistic for a teenage boy to be able to sew well. We witness Peter enter a wrestling ring against Bonesaw to win some prize money. I have to admit, I did not love this part, as Bonesaw is represented by something that looks like it should have been inflated only on Halloween. But that isn't important. Peter walks home and doesn't help Flash from getting his car stolen, only for Uncle Ben to come out to help, and he gets run over. That's not as good as in the comic books, where Peter avoids stopping a thief at the wrestling hall, only to find that that same man later robbed and killed Uncle Ben. That's where we get the whole, with great power, there must also come great responsibility line. While the story in the musical isn't as good, it does prompt Peter to sing what I will argue is the best song of the musical, Rise Above. And you said, rise above. It also cuts to Arachne telling Peter to rise above, but, you know, whatever. Spider-Man then swings through the city, making his heroic debut and flying across the theater. Then we cut to the Daily Bugle newspaper, where publisher J. Jonah Jameson is mad that Spider-Man is getting attention. Peter shows up selling Spider-Man photos. Back at Oscorp, Norman reads the news and figures Spider-Man was created by his work. The U.S. Army shows up and pressures Norman to speed things up in his research in a musical number called Pull the Trigger. Peter and Mary Jane talk and she reveals she has a crush on Spider-Man and also that she wants to be an actress. Peter sings to her about their dreams coming true with the song Picture This. Back at Oscorp, Norman tries to accelerate his research by testing it on himself, which leads to the death of his wife, which was inspired by what happened to Dr. Otto Octavius and his wife in the Spider-Man 2 movie. Norman emerges as the Green Goblin, and it's a very over-the-top outfit, but I'm okay with some of the changes for a musical. The bright green and angular shapes definitely read clearly from the middle of the auditorium. At the Daily Bugle, there's an exposition dump that the Green Goblin kidnapped a bunch of scientists and then Spider-Man saved them. We don't get to see any of this exciting stuff. Next thing you know, Green Goblin has a piano on top of the Chrysler building and sings the song, I'll Take Manhattan. Green Goblin reveals to the audience that he's drugged and kidnapped Spider-Man. He says, He's like Spider-Man's father, since his science gave him birth, and asks Spider-Man to join his criminal takeover of the city. Spider rejects the offer, and, you guessed it, the geek chorus stops everything. 
the Geek Chorus changes the story by saying the Green Goblin has Mary Jane as a hostage. We then have a big battle with a lot of flying stunt work. The Geek Chorus decides that Green Goblin gets webbed to the piano, and when Green Goblin tosses it off the building in anger, he accidentally drags himself down to his death. Peter saves Mary Jane, and Arachne looms overhead. That's all in just Act 1. Act 2 starts with the Geek Chorus wondering where to go from there with Spider-Man's story since they hit all the important beats of his story. Gigi speaks up to say Spider-Man hasn't faced his ultimate enemy yet. They then introduce some new villains in what they call a villain fashion show to decide who should be the ultimate enemy. This is essentially the Sinister Six, although the only members from the comics are Electro and Kraven. Both look a bit different, but they're cool enough. There's also Lizard, who is a lot less interesting, as he's basically just another inflatable bobbing around. To round out the group, they have the obscure villain Swarm, a man made of bees, Carnage, without any real origin story, and Tamor's personal addition, Swiss Miss, a lady that looks like she's walking around in aluminum foil with some knives. After that, Peter shows up late to work and complains about being late to school and late to dates with Mary Jane. When he finally goes to sleep, Arachne sings the title song, Turn Off the Dark, talking about how she wants to mate with Peter. But Peter is awakened from the nightmare by a call from Mary Jane. Peter briefly interacts with the geek chorus directly here, telling them that he was just having a dream. He shows up late to Mary Jane's first acting job, apparently in a musical version of The Fly. Because they're having trouble in the relationship, Peter decides to quit being Spider-Man. He just finished Act 1 deciding to be Spider-Man, and now he's quit before he really does anything. Arachne gets a musical number here called Think Again, where she gets angry that Peter is wasting the gifts that she's given him. Peter announces his love to Mary Jane at a club, and they kiss, only to be interrupted with a blackout. Then Green Goblin begins transmitting a message on screens, and the Geek Chorus speaks up, getting confused as to what's happening. I thought Green Goblin was dead. Well, Arachne's musical Furies explain that they are now in charge of making the story. The Goblin announces that he and the Sinister Seven will destroy the city, and they have a song called Sinisteria, where they wreak havoc while Peter and Mary Jane cuddle at home during the blackout. At this point, the worst and most infamous song begins. In the song, Deeply Furious, Arachne gets jealous of Mary Jane and sings a song about getting shoes. She has her furies stealing shoes and singing along with her. It's awful. There were versions of the musical that had Arachne then confront Jameson to write about her Sinister Seven, and other versions where she marries Spider-Man in some sort of dream sequence. Peter and Mary Jane sing about their love, Mary Jane gets kidnapped by Kraven, and Peter sings his biggest song, Boy Falls from the Sky. Spider-Man defeats the Sinister Seven only to get tangled in Arachne's web. Arachne reveals the Sinister Seven were never real and were just illusions designed to make him become Spider-Man again. They battle, and she sings about how she wants him to either marry her or kill her. Arachne realizes Peter will never stop loving Mary Jane, so eventually she lets Peter go. Then, because she did something good, Arachne ascends to the heavens on the rope that she was hung with, and the musical just kind of ends. It's not great, I've read the book and watched videos, but this was not the version that I saw, and I'm glad. It becomes very clear why it was getting such bad reviews from the press. On top of that, I would say that the story is all over the place in terms of what is real and what isn't, and Spider-Man just isn't proactive enough. Uh, I do wish that I got to see the original cast perform. I saw the people that replaced them eventually, but I'm still glad that I saw the version I did overall because I think the story was better. In early 2011, version 2 was created by Roberto Aguirre Sacasa. The Geek Chorus was completely eliminated, allowing the story to just be the story without interruptions. Arachne watched over things but didn't directly interfere and was greatly reduced. 
It reworked the story to end Act 1 with Norman Osborn becoming the Green Goblin. In Act 2, Norman turns some of his scientists into the Sinister Six, and the finale of the entire musical is the battle between Goblin and Spidey on the Chrysler Building. It gives more time to fleshing out Peter and Mary Jane, and ditches the song about Arachne wanting shoes. When you look at the entire production, there are so many problems. A lack of a strong producer overseeing everything, a lack of fidelity to the source material, massive budget overruns, and not enough care to the stunt work. But there were strong points. The costuming and set design were really innovative and well done most of the time. The stunts looked incredible. Several of the songs were catchy. Uh, Rise Above feels heartfelt. A Freak Like Me Needs Company is a catchy number, and Patrick Page may be playing the Green Goblin campily, but it totally works on stage. The cast was very talented. But that story! The original version averaged an F from critics' reviews on the now-defunct site StageScore, which would compile critic reviews. When they went to version 2, that went up to a C+, which I would argue maybe it deserved a little bit more. It wasn't perfect, but I can say it was an experience. I still listen to a bunch of the songs. They're very catchy, at least some of them. And it was fun. It looked good. It did look good. Uh, the actors were competent and great. I honestly think that, basically, if they had decided, instead of putting it in the most expensive and oldest theater on Broadway, to create this as more of like a traveling circus show, or put it in a modern venue in Las Vegas, it probably would have turned a profit. A few more decisions could have made it profitable. Instead, it holds the record for things like the most preview performances, a ton of injuries, the most expensive production ever. But, as any fan of Spider-Man can tell you, it takes more than bad press to keep Spider-Man down. Thanks so much for taking a look with me at Spider-Man Turn Off the Dark, and if you uh, are so inclined, I'd really appreciate your support. Check out that link in the description below to get my cover to Vampirella. I'm really proud of that. It's only available for a few more days, and I will see you next week for another exciting episode. Until then, keep reading comics. Gigi, the only female member, explains Spider-Man wasn't the first person to have human... human powers? How about spider powers? Good script, Chris. Talking about script problems. And you I know exactly who this is. There's a comic book that we saw in the package last week. This might be Chris. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please consider hitting like and subscribe. If you'd like to support the show, there are merchandise links beneath the YouTube video, and you can always hit join on YouTube or visit Comic Tropes on Patreon to get access to special perks.